Welcome, Steve. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you, Peru. It's always great talking to you, and, and especially when we start talking about stories. I know your love for storytelling, and and I share that love. And and we've had a lot of great engagement just around stories and storytelling. And and I truly appreciate you and all the support that you've given me uh, in terms of storytelling. Uh, speaking uh, and, to, and to talk with you and see what questions can I answer for you about my book and let people know that, hey, this is the best book that's been written in a long time. Yes, yes, yes. This is not just any conversation. This is a rather special conversation because we are here to celebrate you and your first book, Apples and Oranges, on your team. So, Steve, tell us more about this book. Yeah, this book has been a labor of love. Uh, I told my wife the other day, if I'd known how much work it would take to get this book published, I might not have done it. Um, the journey is long in publishing a book. Writing it is actually the easy part. It's getting it produced afterwards that becomes the hard part. The core of this book is a number of stories that center around metaphors. Sometimes people call them parables, but I love using metaphors and stories because they open your mind to other possibilities. They expand your thinking outside the box. If I were as a leader from my leadership background to say, hey, you can go and do one, two, three and become a leader you might hear it, you might take notes, but most likely you're not gonna remember it very long unless somehow I'm very motivational, inspirational, or all those things that I hope to be today. But what I've found is when you can tell or give insights through stories, people remember them uh, because the power of the story just sinks in and, and the great thing about a metaphor is it now becomes an image that when they think of that metaphor, if it's a, a pearl or a tree or a box, I use a number of different metaphors in, in the different stories, they may now think, oh yeah, I remember when Steve talked about, you know, speaking up or self-care or valuing myself. Um, there are a number of incredible lessons in there that I hope every leader will grasp onto. Now, some people say, is this book only for leaders? No, it's my audience is designed to speak to leaders because I wanna encourage them to invest in their people, to leverage relationships for success in their business or in their uh, service, if they're doing nonprofit or even community service. But all of us are leaders in some way, shape, or another. Uh, you know, for me personally, I love my family. So I always think of myself as a leader within my family, you know, as well as work and within my community. Uh, and so you may wear all those hats, or you may only wear one of those hats, but you will find value in these stories to touch your heart and deliver messages to you that maybe you need to hear, that maybe you need to act on to transform how you lead, whether that's at work, at home, or in the community. That's so beautiful, Steve. Yes, we don't have to wear a certain title to be called a leader. We are all leaders in our own base and we don don't so many hats in our life anyway. And most of those roles call for leadership in some form or the other. So I'm sure this is a book that everybody can learn from. I'm one of those fortunate people who had access, who had the opportunity to, to 
read your book before it came out in the market. I've got it here on my phone. And I really love the message that you have shared with the readers, which is stories are like paths leading your audience to where you wish them to go. My hope is to lead you to new insights for personal growth as a leader in your workplace, home, and community. Yeah, it sums up the, the heart behind the book, for sure. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I love the invitation that um, we don't have to be a leader in, in just one frame or walk of life, but we can be leaders everywhere. We can apply those skills at home, in community, at work, whether we are business owners or corporate leaders. Yeah, if you reflect on your life, you'll be able to identify numerous times where you were a leader and that might be informally and taking uh, and stepping forward to, to maybe, you know, collect or sponsor the meals for somebody who's sick. Uh, it could be being the basketball coach for your little league, your son's little league. Um, there are a number of ways that we interact with people. And the important thing that I want to get through this book is how you interact with people makes all the difference in the world. Uh, if you, as I sometimes say, use the power of words for life you can voice life into people you can show appreciation to people you can affirm them and that will give them motivation to do their best to become their best and the group wins when that occurs and so that's the message that i really hope stands out through all the stories and that somebody after reading this can walk away and say, yeah, I want to do more or be more like this or that to invest in the people that are around me. Yeah, yeah. Steve, we are going to talk more about leadership, but I want to share with you that we have a live audience building up here. Jill is here and she has joined us from Wales. Hi, Jill. Thank you for joining us live. Yeah, Jill, great to have you. Steve, so let me ask you the, the chicken and egg question about leadership. Or rather, I don't know if it's a chicken and egg question, but my question to you is, do you think we can be leaders and followers at the same time? I think in a number of different ways, we are leaders and followers at the same time. Uh, and in fact, I think one of the strengths that leaders can exhibit and they don't often do is when they pull a team together and seek to collaborate with their team members and pull out the, you know, the vast differences that people have that can bring to contribute to a solution. And the leader may ultimately champion that, but they don't necessarily have to be the inspiration for it. The group might very well be the inspiration for it. Uh, I know a number of times in my leadership uh, where I have been working with my staff, I've said, you know, I hired you for your best thinking. I didn't hire you to tell me what you think I want to hear. I hired you to give me your best thinking because you may see something that I don't. And I, there were times when my team members would come to me and say, Steve, you know, you're talking about going in this direction, but I think we really ought to go in this direction. And I'll say, okay, why do you think that? And through talking with them and seeing what they see, that what I missed, I've said, hey, you're right, we really should go this direction instead of that direction. And those type of good decisions come from being open to hearing from others and incorporating into the decision-making process their voice to be heard. Uh, and ultimately, that kind of leadership 
creates results uh, for the for the company. It's a win win thing. You know, one of the things that I often hear from companies is, yeah, this touchy feely stuff of investing in employees, you know, might make the employees feel good, but it's just going to cost me money. And usually I come back and say, hey, if your people are performing at their best, do you not think your company is going to be succeeding? And I can give them a company or two where they have implemented this uh, in some form where they elevate their people and then their success has gone with it. We are on the same page here, Steve. I do believe that a true leader is somebody who's able to step up and lead a team as and when required, but they are also humble enough to fold their hands in humility and follow the lead when that is what is called for in that particular situation. Definitely, because again, one of the things that I often talk about is strengths. And each individual may have different strengths. And when you understand what these strengths are, you can begin to leverage them on a team level. Uh, and when I talk about strengths, I use the mental definition, psychological definition of um, Gallup and their definition of strengths, 34 strengths that Donald Clifton um, came up with uh, when he built his strength finder assessment. And if you look at those different strengths, they all contribute in some way to success but no one individual has all of them. For example, maybe you're a great communicator. You don't have the strategic strength. So when you go into a strategic planning session, it might behoove you to find that person on your team that does have that strategic strength to come in and assist you in helping you plan effectively. Uh, maybe you've got the strategic strength and you can think through exactly what needs to happen quicker than other people, but you don't know how to communicate it. And that might behoove you to find somebody on your team who's got the communication strength that can pair up with you to deliver the message that you want to be given to support the strategic vision that you're building. Uh, no, we can't. The biggest mistake a leader can do is try and be all things to all people. Uh, in fact, I, I often tell people or leaders, it's not your weaknesses that you need to work on. It's your strengths. Because you're, when you leverage your strengths, you're going to have so much more success than if you try to take a weakness and maybe become okay with it. You know, it's not gonna, you're not gonna have success there. Uh, an example of that might be, hey, I'd love to, I've always wanted to play an instrument, but I haven't had the drive, the uh, inherent ability to pick up and play an instrument, but I could certainly take that weakness and discipline myself and I could learn to play. But my level of playing would be far poorer than somebody who's in a band or an orchestra where they have been practicing hours and hours and utilizing their strengths and making those strengths even better. Uh, and so what are your strengths? You know, that's what I encourage people. If you can find out what those strengths are, then you can work on them and magnify them. And in fact, you, Paula, you and I had a great conversation on strengths last time we got together. So uh, not to get too far down that path. <laughs> <laughs> now you bring up such an amazing point about strengths, Steve. 
I think most of us are conditioned to look at our areas for improvement because because that, that's just the in thing. <laughs> that's how most people operate. But if you were to look at our strengths and operate from our strengths, life would be so much easier, work would be so much easier, and it's going to be a lot more fun. Yes, you'll be a lot more fulfilled in what you're doing, for sure. Yeah, yeah. and then everybody can ex excel. Mm -hmm. mm. We also have Carolyn, who has joined us from Singapore. Uh, hey, Carolyn. It's great to have hey, you. Hey, Carolyn. Come. Great to have you. Steve, is it fair to say that your decades of leadership experience has been distilled into this book, Apples and Oranges? It, it has in, in indirect ways, more than direct ways. You know, I didn't sit down and say, what leadership lessons would I want to teach somebody and spell it out in a book like many other leaders might? I approached it from the standpoint of here are things that I encountered and I created a story around that to help others who might encounter such situations think about how they might react facing that situation. There's, a, I mean, there's lessons in there on a personal level, like self-help, to lessons in there on how to work with your team and how to work with individuals to build up the individuals. Certainly, you'll see throughout all the stories a positive positivity that radiates from these stories because the goal is always to take potentially somebody who's struggling with something and make them successful and lift them up and help them over the thing that's holding them back. And the metaphors become this tangible way for me to deliver that type of encouragement to an individual. Now, sometimes people have asked me, are these true stories? And the reality is, no, they're not. They're, they're all fiction-based stories. Now they're, you know, like Hollywood, you know, has a movie that says, oh yeah, this is, Kind of based on a true story some of these stories are like that you know they 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 remind us in my career i remember certain situations that have come up and then i've taken that and then created a fictional story to highlight that um, but i'm always honored when people think they're real stories uh, because that tells me that one the dialogue that's going on there is resonating with people, that it's coming across like, hey, this is reality. Um, and, and that is a great accomplishment, I think, as a writer, to be able to, to deliver that type of material and content to people. Yeah, so they are fictional stories, but they're grounded in reality. I don't know that I'd say they're all grounded in reality, but they're all grounded in some element of truth. Mm -hmm. And those truths are the kind of things that I want to encourage people to reflect on. In fact, in the beginning of the book, I have a little two-page section talking about how to use this book. And I suggest to, to leaders that they read one story a day you almost treat it like a meditation uh in two three minutes you can read a story they're that they're bite-sized stories but each story hopefully will leave you thinking about the message of that story uh, i usually close the story with some kind of question just to kind of prime that pump to get people's minds thinking about, okay, use this metaphor and this story to represent this. Okay, now how does that show up in my life? And if it's not showing up in my life, what must I do to maybe get it to show up in my life? Uh, because I'd really like to see the impact that would have by 
by growing and transforming and becoming that influential leader that is able to move mountains with people. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that, how this book is different from most other books, especially the leadership book. So it's not just an invitation to read a story, but also to glean the learning and integrate that learning through reflection and, uh, and, and journaling. Yeah, I, I sometimes tell people, this is not a how-to book. Mm. If you're looking for a how-to book, this is not it. Mm -hmm. This is a what-if book. In other words, what if I implemented some of these lessons into my life? What would the impact be? I want people to think down those lines, to be bold and to try some of the things that are in the book and to see where it leads and what it might do for them as a leader and for their teams, because I, these stories in my mind are great, uh, short things that could be used as an icebreaker at a meeting. If you've got a team meeting on a weekly basis, you could take one story a week and you could read it out and then, you know, throw out one question or something related to the story, get people talking about it and then charge into your agenda. Um, the power of doing that is stories pull people in. So you might actually get them to turn off their laptops or their phones and actually listen and then engage. And once they start engaging in the story, hopefully they'll be prepared to engage in the agenda and issues and things that you need to talk about with the team going forward. Um, and one of the things that I have done is I've created a discussion guide for this book. When I got done with the discussion guide, it was almost as long as the book itself. Uh, the book is like 150 pages. The discussion guide comes to 90 pages. Now, a lot of that's fluff in the sense that there's a lot of space in between questions and things like that. So it's not a, it's a very short read. But what I wanted to put into the discussion guide is two sets of questions, group questions. So if you wanted to use this within your team or within a peer group, you could ask those questions to draw out insights from different team members or peers regarding the story and maybe help fuel in each other's mind ideas on things that you could try with your teams. Uh, but I also have a set of questions specifically for leaders. I want to challenge the leaders to em embrace the message and incorporate and spend some time relating to it, not just saying, oh, yeah, that was a good message, and then they quickly forget it, but to take a few minutes, like you said, journal it, reflect on it, and maybe take action from it. Uh, the guide also includes some exercises for leaders. Uh, and as I went through these, I thought, you know, if I'd had this starting out as a leader, this would have been great. Because ultimately, if you were to take one story a week, you have over six months of material there. Uh, all based on, in some way, with leadership and leadership development. And if you do the exercises that are given with each story, it will change you as a leader. I guarantee you that by the end of the six months, you will be a different leader, you will be a better leader, and you may even become that best boss that somebody has ever worked for that we all want to work for. And uh, I encourage that type of growth and development. I think we have lots of how-to books and not enough of what if books. So thank you for writing this book because this is going to change how people practice leadership. 
how they step up as leaders in their families, in their communities, and at work. Yeah, definitely. I I love what I call business fable books. So if you if you ever read Who Moved My Cheese, um, the five dysfunctions of a team, the goal, um, all of those books were written from a fable story, a fictional point of view to convey messages. Um, and they do so in a way that's captivating. And that's what I hope these stories will do is a little bit of falling in that genre of business fable so that people can uh, be maybe edutained using Rob House's word of, of uh, education and entertainment and bring them together. Uh, that's the goal is to, the stories have that element of entertainment, but yet they have an element of education to them that hopefully impacts a person in a greater way than just sitting down and reading a reference book about, okay, here's how to do this as a leader. Edutainment. Yes. Tell us, Steve, how did you find the inspiration to write this book? Well, this journey has been 30 years in the making. Uh, way back in the early 90s, I found myself thinking of short stories that I just wanted to create out there. I had um, read a book that was very similar um, that basically told these short little tales and left the person to think and meditate on it. And I really liked that approach. So I started writing and I probably wrote about a dozen stories before I stopped, <laughs> before again, my day in day in work life and all the other things I was doing just was like, yeah, I don't have time to do this. But in the last few years, especially since I got on LinkedIn and started producing social media content, I stumbled across these old stories and I pulled one of them out and said, hey, you know, I think I could turn this into content for LinkedIn. And so I did. And at the time, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. I wasn't sure if anybody would like it. Um, what not uh, but i put it out there and i got a great response to it uh, people liked it they wanted to read more and so i just said okay weekly i'll produce a story uh and and i run i ran the, these stories through a series called story saturday on linkedin uh, where in the last Three years, I think, that I've been doing this. Um, it started in 2019, so two two years or so. I've published over 90 stories on LinkedIn, um, and I've, so now I've got a wealth of material. My first set was very much leadership oriented. My second set was very much focused on the strengths from the Gallup Strength Finder. So that could be volume two to this coming forth is again, stories to show people how strengths show up in lives uh, so that they can potentially maybe see, oh yeah, that sounds like me. Um, and I, I, I love writing short stories for me. It's, short stories are great because I get a thought in an hour, I can crank out the story and I can be done with it. But what I haven't done is really try to write some long fiction uh, or even a long manuscript uh, where that requires more structure, more discipline, <laughs> more commitment to get done. Sort of like probably what you did 
to write your uh, story, your cancer story. Uh, someday I'll write my cancer story too. Um, but not yet. I'm doing short stories and loving it. <laughs> well, I think there's a different flavor to long stories and short stories. And, uh, and just because they are short stories doesn't mean that uh, less work goes in. In fact, I would say as a speaker and uh, as a story coach, when we want to pack our information in less number of words or shorter durations, it has to be crisp. It, there's no option. There is no leeway to just come in and waffle. <laughs> there's no time or space for that. So I think doing shorter stories is probably more challenging than doing the longer ones. It can be. Now, one of the things I found with LinkedIn is they had a, they had a character limit of 1,300 characters, which I recently noticed in one of my last stories that I don't think that limit is there anymore. I don't know what uh, the it's gone. I think it's 3000 now. 3000. Wow. Oh, I could really write a long story because I used to write, just write the story out and it could be 1800 uh, characters when I got done and I'd be like, ah, oh, I got to cut a third of this somehow. And you're right. It's sometimes easier to do that longer stuff because you can throw in things in there, details that you might want to add to the story that you think might contribute to the story that when you're compressed, you've got to say, okay, this adverb's going out, this detail's going out. Here is the core of the story that has to be presented. Um, for one of the, I guess one of my gifts is the ability to do that. Um, one thing I never thought I would do. I mean, I, I've always struggled with the English language, even though I'm a native English speaker. Um, I've always struggled with the writing. But one of the things I learned is if you practice certain things, you can't overcome those limits. And so for me, I've been fortunate over the last several decades to have people that have edited my stuff and through their editing, I've learned from them to say, oh, okay, I'll watch out for this. I'll do this differently. And uh, I love that type of feedback because I will definitely grow from it and become better for it. Uh, so I don't know if there's any truth to the fact that uh, an author's book is not necessarily their best book. Um, it's maybe the books down the road uh, as they become better at it. Uh, I, will, I will say this book has a lot of value. Even as I was editing it for the umpteenth time, I don't know, 13, 14 different times, I catch myself reading a story and be like, oh, I need that message today. And I was like, I'm talking to myself and, uh, and reminding me of things that I know I should be doing. And if I do them, I know it will bring about greater results and transformation and life for me and hopefully for others. Uh, Cause that's, you know, again, that title, life-giving leadership. And what does that mean? It means being the kind of leader that when people work with you, they come away energized. They come away having benefited from knowing you. They come away a better person. Uh, and that, that can mean within the workplace, helping somebody go from that entry level position into leadership. Uh, one of my uh, co-workers for 20 years, you know, I hired her in as an entry level programmer. She's now a director, a very good director. In fact, I think, and I've encouraged her, she could become a CIO if she really wanted to pursue it. Uh, but 
to have had a part of her journey from there up uh, tells me that yes, in some way I had an impact on her. Uh, and I know I've had an impact on others as well. That is life-giving leadership. You know, some people are afraid to do that because they think, oh, wow, well, like this person gets really good and there's no place for them in our organization, they're going to leave. Well, if you're a life-giving leader, it's kind of like potting a flower, okay? At some point in time, you have to say, okay, this plant is outgrowing this pot and I got to repot it uh, because you don't want the plant to die or stay where it is. And so as a leader, if you're life-giving, you'll know that there's time when your people have reached the point when they're ready for that next pot. And if you don't have it for them, then you need to be prepared to support them and say, hey, I think you're ready for the next level. We don't have that here within the organization, but I will support you if you want to go out and seek and find that uh, someplace else. Uh, and ultimately what happens is companies then pollinate other companies. Yeah. And the connections between the companies become strong uh, and enable them to leverage company company relationships. So you can go all over the place with this, with the messages that I'm talking about. There's seeds, plant those seeds, water those seeds, watch them grow. And you might be surprised at, at what comes forth. It could be a giant redwood tree, could be a great apple tree with delicious apples, or it could just be a beautiful rose bush pollinating the world. You, you just don't know. But life can show up in so many different ways. That's so beautiful, Steve. That's so beautiful. If I have to look at the whole discipline of leadership or the skill of leadership and put it down to one phrase, it would be, it's got to be life-giving. If it is not life-giving, it's not being a true leader. We aren't being true leaders. Yeah, and if, if you're not a life-giving leader, you're probably a life-killing leader. Yes. Uh, and your teams ultimately are going to be disengaged. They're not going to be as productive. They may be looking for the next opportunity to get off the boat, out of your realm of leadership. Um, and companies then hurt themselves. Quite honestly, if companies really wanted to excel, they would spend more time on leadership development and making sure they had the right leaders in place, giving life to others than they would acquiring this or doing this or doing that. Um, I mean, Gallup, Gallup honestly will tell you only one out of 10 leaders is geared to manage people. Mm -hmm. That means 10% of the people that are in leadership know how to work with people to potentially be life-giving leaders. And the other 90%, not so. They might very well be the life-sucking leaders. They're just winging it. They are. They are. And I sometimes use the metaphor of you can be a desert as a leader. And so your people are wandering around in the desert and there's no water. The sun's sucking the life out of them. Or you can be an oasis in the desert where people want to come and be nourished, be refreshed, and be ready to take that next step in their journey. So true, so true. And the choice is ours, only ours to make. It is. Yeah. Definitely. And so a lot of that, again, stems back to the stories that I wrote of 
you approach things looking at it as okay i'm the king of my domain uh people are supposed to follow me uh i know better than others or maybe you even say i'm not sure what i'm doing but i don't want anybody else to know i'm not i don't know what i'm doing uh all of those things break down leadership you have to look at it from the standpoint of a leader is a part of a group so how can i work effectively within that group within my role to become the best possible leader for that team i mean you hire people to your team you know if you're an it like me maybe you're hiring a database person or programmer or an analyst you want that analyst to become the best analyst they can become you want that programmer to become the best programmer they can become but do you sit around and look at yourself and say am i becoming the best leader i can become that's what you've been assigned that's your task your role and far too often i see leaders sitting on their hands running this place and that, um, not really leading. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. If we can just remember that helping others shine does not take our light away, I think we'll be all great leaders. Yeah, definitely. I don't. I don't know anybody who's been a servant who hasn't ultimately been lifted up by the people that they served. I mean, look at Mother Teresa, um, you know, leading basically a convent in India, ministering to the poor, the needy. She was not a big spokesperson. She simply served people. And through her example of that service, people wanted to know more. And it gained her hearing that she was then able to use worldwide to say to people, hey, be humble, serve others, think of others more than yourself. And everybody knows who Mother Teresa is. You know, um, I hope and, and pray that I can leave an impact in this world some way that people would think of me more as like Mother Teresa than like um, Dale Carnegie or um, J.P. Morgan, some of those parents of old. Yeah. Mother Teresa lived her message. I would say her life was her message, wasn't it? Yes, and that, that is a great point about leadership. Your life is a message as a leader. People are looking at you, even if you're not asking them to. Just by the fact you've been assigned that lead role, they will look to you. And I encourage you to make sure that what they see is an example of service of lifting up others that will get you further in your career and in your business than trying to lord it over people yeah from my personal experience i can say that the most amazing parts of my work life have been when i was mentored by some of the most amazing leaders mentored coached uh, reporting to these managers bosses who were just amazing their their job was to help me and other team members shine and when we did that when we showed we make them look good so together everybody was better off because they were such amazing leaders yes and such leaders often are willing for the credit to go to the people that are doing the work they don't feel threatened if the credit goes to you, Peru, as the 
uh, communications part of our team uh, versus me as the so-called manager or director. Um, they, they see leadership as a role and responsibility, not as a title or status. And, you know, I challenge leaders, if you've gotten into a leadership position, ask yourself, why did you do that? Was it for money? Was it for status? Or was it because you wanted to do more to help others and leadership gave you the platform to make a bigger impact on others? So true, so true, yeah. We've got to come back to that question, why we are doing what we are doing, isn't it? Yes, definitely. Mm. Oh, what a delightful conversation on leadership and how we can become leaders every day in whatever roles we are playing. Steve, tell us, how can people get their hands on this book? This book will be available in Amazon. It will also be available through uh, the standard world distribution route that Ingram Spark supports. So bookstores can, it'll be in their uh, sales catalog, whatever they call it, uh, in terms of books that they offer that then, you know, local bookstores can order up copies. Um, you can potentially open your own bookstore <laughs> and sell it. Um, uh, and that's, that's another way of, of doing it as well. Um, and my hope, my hope is that it will be available tomorrow on Amazon. Uh, I've been doing the KDP process and the ebook is out there for pre-sale and will be available tomorrow for sure. But they just, did this new feature with KDP where you can uh, get hardback covers. And so I had done all the work for the softback and then when I, you know, and that wasn't an option then, but a couple of weeks ago I popped on to check on something and I saw, oh, wow, they've got this new option they call, it's in beta. So then I quickly did the formatting work I needed to submit it and uh, and I got a printed proof of concept from Amazon. It looked great. So I'm I'm excited for what they're doing to allow authors not only to have that soft copy but the hardback because you know I've talked to people who said I want a hardback copy. Uh, and if you want to get into libraries, libraries want hardback copies more than they want paperback copies. Um, so it's another avenue for authors to have their books get out. Uh, but in saying that, I noticed that by somehow, and it probably because it's in beta mode, as I said to Amazon, you can now publish my soft and my hardback you know, I saw it change status, and then I went back in a few days later, and it was back to draft status. And I was like, this does not make sense. If you've done the KDP, you'll see that um, draft is when you first start out. And once you say publish it, it goes into review mode, and then it comes back in a slide. Um, so I'm working it out with Amazon now as to how and when they will complete the process. And maybe what I needed to do was get them to do and activate live the soft copy, then come back and activate live the hardback instead of doing both at the same time. Um, so we will see. If it doesn't show up tomorrow, it will show up very soon, yeah. probably by the weekend or next week sometime. Like you said, writing was the easiest part. 
it, it was, but editing, oh man. <laughs> I, I compared the editing process to like purgatory. You, you keep going back and doing it again and again till you get it right. <laughs> Um, but yes, it, you know, if you want to be an author someday, I encourage people to tell their story and become an author, but make sure that you understand, are you doing it just for yourself and your family? Because that's pretty easy to do, but if you're doing it as something to market or build a business around, then it's got all sorts of production things. The quality of the cover comes into play. The marketing stuff all comes into play. And um, so I've learned a lot along the way. Certainly have not been uh, perfect in my execution, uh, which is fine because we, when we first start out with things, we will make mistakes and then we will learn from them. So. I'm in that stage and soon, well, I, I actually do have real copies of my book in my hand from Ingram Spark. Um, so from that standpoint, I can celebrate. I'm there. I'm an author. This is not a, a hope to be or maybe someday, but it really is. Do I see a copy of your book behind you? Yes, you do. Uh, I don't know how people can read it, but again, it's apples and oranges on your team. Bite-sized stories for life-giving leadership. So if you love parables, if you love short stories, you're going to enjoy this book. Uh, you know, I'm always amazed when I talk to people who have read the stories. And I say, well, what, what are your favorite stories? Um, and maybe I'll just even ask you that from the stories you read, what do you, what story or two do you remember? Hmm. That's a tough one, Steve, because each of the stories were based on, on a specific metaphor. And as you said, each of those stories were grounded in some version, some truth. And so I connected with each of those stories. Okay, so you, you, which is great. I love it when people can connect with more stories than not. But I have come to see that there will be stories that maybe you don't connect with, mm -hmm. but others will connect with it. Uh, I certainly learned in writing the stories that I am not a good judge of the story. <laughs> uh, I, I would write these stories, and I'm so thankful for Maria Costella. He was my writing partner because I would write a story and I'd say, this is not very good. Mm. I don't know if I should publish this. Mm -hmm. And I'd give it to him and he'd read it and say, Steve, this is good. You've got to publish this. And so then I would, and then I'd get all this great response to it when I thought nobody would like it whatsoever. Uh, and then there are a few times where I've written something, I thought, oh, this is good. I really like that, you know, what I created here and I put it out there and it kind of goes flat. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> but, you know, one of the key things and the reasons this book does exist is early on when I started doing these stories, I started collaborating with individuals uh, at first and in most of the cases it was me coming up with an idea um, executing the story and then saying of my LinkedIn partners that I know who might be who who might echo this message in some of their content and things who would want to come alongside me and collaborate and so then I would uh, collaborate with them, sometimes very simply like, okay, here's the story, here's the message. You know, you do a video post talking about the message from however you wanna uh, bring it. 
and this is a story then that I'll publish. Along the way, a few individuals came forward to me and say, Steve, it would be good if you wrote a story to address this. Uh, a good example of that was Elizabeth Wim. She brought up how Australians really look down upon self-help. So I, I wrote a story to address that. Uh, Lori Knudsen, uh, who's a career transition specialist, she came to me and said, Steve, I think you know, in our world today that more experienced workers, us older workers, whatever, are not being taken seriously. Can you write a story to address that? And so I would think about it, think about it, and I'd come up with a story. Um, and in fact, the story that I wrote, you know, collaborating with Lori was the aged Scott story that's in there. And that was by far my most received story uh, in terms of, of comments, views, all that other stuff. It's like three times my next best story. Um, so I really touched people's hearts with that story. Um, so it, read the book, read the stories. Read you the can, stories, it, yeah. You can, yeah I mean, you can read the whole book in an hour if you sit down and crank through it. But that's like having a Halloween bowl of candy. You're just, <laughs> you're just eating each piece of candy and not really enjoying it, okay? Um, better for you to lengthen that enjoyment out by taking a story here and a story there and uh, meditating on it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Steve, many, many congratulations to you. You are now a published author. And uh, when the book is available for us to pre-order, please tell us. I will. I will give you the link to it as soon as it's recognized on Amazon. Yeah. It's been such a delightful conversation, Steve. Wishing you loads of luck with your new book. Thank you, Peru. And I so appreciate your support, your kindness, your continued work that you do with people and telling stories and helping them tell their stories. Um, you're, you're a woman after my heart in that sense. And I really appreciate you. Thank you so much, Steve. And thank you to everybody who has joined us live. And Steve, once again, wishing you all the very best.